Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, if you've been joining us for the previous sessions as well, then welcome back. My name is Srilata Sarkar. I am a lecturer in India and Global Affairs at the King's India Institute and the convener of the Confronting Caste series. This is the third in a series of events that we are organizing over the course of this academic year. The aim behind the series is to expand the scope of critical engagement with caste as a structure of social power in both historical and contemporary perspectives. This term, we have had two exciting panel events that have been taking place every alternate Thursday. And today is the third and last installment for this term. And we will be back with a new lineup of events for next term. We are also releasing a companion piece to the seminars in the form of a podcast in which I speak to researchers from various disciplines and geographies about their work on the everyday operations of caste power in everyday social contexts. Please do keep an eye on the King's India Institute website and social media handles to know more about these events and releases. And you're welcome to contact Vignesh Rajamani, who is doctoral candidate at the Institute and coordinator of the Confronting Caste series. For today's panel, we have two very interesting presentations lined up. We have with us Anju Christine Lingam, who is a doctoral candidate at King's College London. She's a Commonwealth scholar and her work is on Dalit women's activism in Bangalore, Delhi and Nagpur. Today, Anju will be speaking on Dalit women's legal activism and the possibilities of a Dalit feminist legal theory. Welcome Anju, we are very happy to have you with us. Thank you for having me. We also have with us Dr. Murli Shanmugavelan. Uh, Murli is an independent researcher and consultant currently leading a national level research team to assess the working conditions of gig workers in Bangladesh. He received his doctoral degree from SOAS and his work is concerned with the disavowal of caste in media and communication studies and digital cultures. Murli contends that caste should be recognized as a category in communication studies in the same manner as gender, race and sexuality. Today, Murli will outline the challenges and opportunities around acknowledging the existence, the existence of and the criminalizing of caste practices in non-Indian contexts with examples from Britain, EU, and most recently the US. And he will present a proposal to acknowledge the modern manifestations of caste. Welcome Murli, thank you for joining us today. Chairing the session today, we have Professor Prabha Koteshwaran, who is Professor of Law and Social Justice at King's College London. She's the author of Dangerous Sex, Invisible Labor, Sex Work and the Law in India, which was the winner of the 2012 SLSA Hart Prize. She's also the co-author of many other edited volumes. She was awarded the Labour Hume Prize in 2014 and is currently the PI for an European Research Council Consolidated Grant on the Laws of Social Reproduction. So with that brief introduction, I'm going to hand over to Prabha, who will introduce the topic for the day and get the session started. Thank you so much, uh, Shilata and Vignesh, for having curated this absolutely wonderful uh, seminar series on confronting caste. Uh, I cannot think of a more urgent uh, issue for scholars of India to be engaged with at this moment in time. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this uh, particular seminar on caste and the legal regime. Uh, I think for many disadvantaged groups uh, all across India, uh, the law and the legal system is a site uh, for hope. Um, and often it is hope that is not realized um, in reality, as we've seen with a number of cases of caste atrocities. Uh, so whether it's uh, you know, those from the women's movement, whether it's those from the anti-caste movement, um, and as we are also increasingly seeing with the farmers movement, uh, the law is a highly contested site where movements make claims of the state, uh, but are unfortunately at the receiving end of the violence of the law itself. And I think this is particularly the case when it comes to anti-caste movements. Um, and so one might even question whether one can have a distinction between you know, the caste and the law. Um, many Dalit scholars have in fact argued that uh, caste is the law uh, in Indian society, and to that extent, I think uh, the you know the priorities of the legal system uh, and the state often align with uh, those uh, of the upper caste um, in 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 India today. So, uh, I think I will uh, hand over now to our speakers who uh, come at this issue of caste and uh, the legal regime 
uh, from quite different angles. Uh, Anju will be speaking on, on sexual violence and how uh, the Dalit feminist movement has engaged with the law and obviously, um, uh, you know, also Murli's presentation on how caste should be a category uh, within communication studies. So now I invite Murli to um, uh, speak to us. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Prabha, for having me. And thank you, Srilata uh, Vignesh. <clears throat> and I have to say, uh, particularly, I liked Tanju's presentation because I'm glad it went first. And it's sort of uh, what I'm saying, going to say now, it sort of tags along um, because I'm not going to summarize Anju's complex presentation, but um, to to say that Anju has eloquently spoke about, spoken about um, Dalit feminist uh, their their uh, discourses and their criticism in response to the state AC agency and then how the law actually inadequacies of law and then back and forth con con conversations and so on. And my talk precisely goes to the next level of this. What I'm trying to look at is that um, th while this is particularly extremely important because what Anju has spoken about uh, also referred to and explained about painful, brutal, humiliated atrocities uh, uh, that are very hard to even say and, and you know, repeat uh, uh, in textual form. Um, at the same time, I'm also trying to point out the attention that the legal regimes are becoming more and more complex in, in contemporary world. And um, especially when you talk about the globalization of caste or, and then uh, the implications of, um, of it, because it's very, it's one thing to pay attention to brutal and uh, a violent form of uh, uh, caste atrocities. But it, uh, what also happens is that um, the violent form is often seen as an aberration, um, but everyday practices are more seen as cultural. And as a result, what happens is that legal regimes are converted into, into unconventional spaces, everyday spaces. So they remain legal regimes in everyday consciousness, in everyday, which are not necessarily within the purview of law. Now, what I'm trying to say now, I'd like to, um, so what I'm going to say is not necessarily applicable in non-Indian context. It's very much applicable in Indian context as well, but it kind of takes a different form when you put the global context to it. So to that extent, it is actually non-Indian, but it's definitely applicable to Indian context as well, especially if you look at what's going on right now with the way that uh, Hindutva has become a cultural expression. <clears throat> um, so what I'm proposed to do now very quickly, I would like to talk about what has been happening in the UK and what's been uh, going on in the EU and most recently the USA and then where this everyday regime is actually trying to play out. And as a result, what is that some of us are trying to do both in academic scholarship and, in, and as part of activism as well and try and propose some you know, signs of moving forward, so to speak. <clears throat> Uh, now, those of you who follow the, this country's uh, record on anti-caste work uh, know very well that um, the Equality Act in 2015, I know, the Equality Act um, 2010 um, eventually recognized caste as a form of protected characteristic. <clears throat> this means caste will become a specific characteristics. It will have a legal status. In other words, caste is becoming criminalized. And following that, the government work, at least in, in texts and in, 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 if you look at the previous documents, in, in a, if you look at the July 2018, the official stated position of the United Kingdom was, no one should suffer prejudice or discrimination on any grounds, including any perception of their caste. And <clears throat> they also said, which is somewhat contentious in certain groups of anti-caste campaigners, but let me put it out. Caste discrimination is race discrimination, where the climate can show that caste is related to ethnic origin, which itself an aspect of rage, race discrimination in the Equality Act. But the takeaway was the government did recognize caste, one way or the other. But then, as expected, um, we have a very strong influential oppositional stakeholders and lobbyists in Westminster, and they uh, somehow pushed a consultation. The consultation actually was slightly disingenuous and took us one step back. 
the consultation should have been how caste should have been criminalized. What are the steps to do that? Instead, the consultation opened whether the caste existed in the UK or not. If not, to what extent? If it exists, should we follow the case law route or should we follow the legal act route? And this was already decided. So the government actually opened the can of worms in many ways. I'm not going to explain the long process of what happened after the arduous process. Um, the, oh, here's another important thing that I, one, one might, be, uh, might be useful for those who are not following up this case. There was a case called Turkey and Chandok versus Chandok. And the Turkey versus Chandok was the first case in the UK history where a woman recruited from India to be a domestic servant for a family in the UK and paid 11p an hour and was grossly ill-treated and badly uh, treated in, you know, she was not really allowed to sleep and so on, has been, was awarded almost 184,000 pounds in as unpaid wages and uh, settlement. So this was the first of our time in the UK, a judgment was given against caste discrimination. So this sets a precedent. But so you have consultation now start kick, kicking in. Before that, Thai Turkey versus Chando case law you have. So the consultation is saying, we already have established a case law that there's a caste discrimination exists in the UK. So why don't we simply depend on case law, not actually introducing another act? And this was actually a very clever tool pushed by the lobbyists. And after the long dubious consultation, uh, which I, I can t t say very fairly, but I'm not going into details why they call it dubious. The government now, as it stands, um, uh, as per the consultation, following the consultation analysis, uh, which was questioned by many of us, uh, the validity of the analysis of the consultation, the way they actually analyzed the findings. The government now intends to repeal the duty in section 9.9 subsection 5 Equality Act 2010 that what, that's, what this means is that they're going to take the word caste out from the Equality Act. So that's where we stand, the UK government stands now. However, the UK government does acknowledge the existence of caste in the UK. Um, the government actually says now, the decision in Turkey versus Chandok shows that someone claiming caste discrimination may rely on the existing statutory prohibition of race discrimination whether they can show that their caste is related to their ethnic origin, which is itself an aspect of race discrimination in the Equality Act. So conflating caste with race. And then the other thing is that because it's conflated, let us erase caste from the act. So this is quite disturbing. Um, you know, it's actually regressive. They've gone a step forward and then that went backward. This is what is happening. Now the acts uh, some of the, um, uh, some activists, um, uh, uh, we, you know, we have a pro legislation stakeholders group in this country and we are trying to actively revive the debate. Um, it is also worth remembering the UK Hate Crime Act uh, recognizes caste as a characteristic. So there is a, another route to revive the debate uh, that potentially could criminalize caste behavior. I'll come to that in a minute later. Um, that's with the UK scenario. In the EU, um, uh, the, Europe, the European Union has consistently recognized caste-based discrimination and violence against the Dalits in the business, economy, and most importantly, in everyday practices. These are acknowledgement, uh, thanks to uh, you know, advocacy organizations who've been constantly pressurizing them, lobbying them in Geneva. However, the European Union is yet to develop concrete policy-oriented action plan. So they haven't moved further than a rhetoric. I mean, it's not rhetoric, it's a poly endorsement in, this, in their official document, but they have not moved further. Um, but recently, some of us are actually pressing um, uh, uh, you know, European Agencies Forum. For example, I was part of the uh, uh, European Regional Forum on Hate Speech, Social Media and Minorities, where <clears throat> we made a very persuasive case to um, take the European uh, Regional Forum to recognize caste as a, a distinctive hate speech that should be recognized uh, on par with uh, <clears throat> race, anti-Semitism, and sexual uh, hate speech related to sexual orientation. <clears throat> so things are moving in the direction, but not quite fast as we want. And that's in the EU. In the US, there's no law, as we know, to criminalize caste-based discrimination. However, um, you know, most of you have followed the Cisco caste scandal. Um, and there, there is an interesting aspect to the Cisco caste scandal. Um, 
<clears throat> I don't know where, when to say it, so I'm going to say it right now, even though it might sound a little bit digression and irrelevant. Um, if you, anyone, those who followed the Cisco cast scandal cast, the interesting part was outing of a person, Dalit. Now, outing of a Dalit, it's uh, when it's done in not um, according to the victim's term, it becomes an harassment. However, um, in most cases, outing does happen, but in a more sophisticated way, and um, harassment continues to take place, and that is that becomes intangible. So it's very it's very hard to put your hands on the matter. That's the point I'm driving home, to be honest. So in the Cisco cast scandal, as most of you know, that uh, a person was outed, a dominant caste person outed a Dalit, and then as a result, he suffered um, um, <clears throat> promotions, and uh, you know, then he was denied responsibilities, projects. Um, the state of California has committed to take the case forward, and uh, this has received considerable media attention in the US and outside. So that's a very quick snapshot, um, given the time. So outside South Asia, because we have caste being recognized in Nepal, um, not necessarily in Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, um, uh, um, and I think um, um, Bhutan as well, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, but outside South Asia, the UK government is the only government has recognized caste as a protected characteristic, one way or the other. So uh, at the moment, speaking legally, at the moment, it is still part of the UK Equality, UK Equality Act, but they intend to repeal this. Um, uh, the, but the UK Racist and Religious Hate Crime Prosecution Guidance recognizes caste as a protected characteristic when probing a hate crime incident. So that's one thing to do. Now, why do we actually, why, do, why am I talk, mapping this out in different ways? So what's happening if you look at uh, uh, um, the global campaign that, that's been taking on various levels, we are seeing a, a, a manifestation of caste that is not something that is going to uh, emotionally um, shake you up. However, this has the potential to wreck a human life. And, and dignity and has the potential to humiliate humans or Dalits on a daily basis. Not just Dalits, but also other oppressed caste groups as well. So, and the problem is not all of them can be punished by the law. And even if it is brought into the law, there can be a very clear, genuine, reasonable argument be made to say that this is not punishable. And I'll come to that again So in a minute. Um, uh, so the reactions, if you see, in response to what's going on, not just the UK, uh, but in the US and the EU, that people are now advocates, um, activists, and academics, researchers, and have begun to pay attention to what I call um, everyday practices. And these benign practices may appear to be very, um, you know, not very violent, but as I always say in my, in, in my, in my as I said in my work, caste is a, if caste is a virus, whether it's, a living, whether it's active or dormant, it doesn't matter. In fact, when, when it's a very subtle cultural practice, the virus is dormant, which means the virus is actually kept in a very conducive environment for only for it to activate when the moment is required, when the moment is right. So, in fact, in order to attack the violent, brutal forms of atrocities, one has to pay more attention to the benign forms of everyday practices. And that actually can happen when we look at the unconventional legal regimes. By unconventional legal regimes, you know, say everyday practices and so on. Um, the reason is shaming, conscious exclusion, segregation, insensitivity may not result in physical violence but can be systematically, institutionally, physically more damaging and violent. And how do we capture that? You know, it came to the, in, how do we articulate this new, manif not necessarily new, but this sort of manifestation that's are happening, especially outside South Asia. And it's very new to um, 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 verbalize and you know, articulate in established legal texts and formats to state agencies and non-state actors who are not familiar with this phenomenon. 
Um, so it's a very dramatic uh, statement that uh, uh, that appeared in the Isabel Wilkerson's uh, uh, latest book, um, which is quite dramatic. So I might as well use it. Um, <clears throat> Cast is the wordless usher in a darkened theater. Flashlight cast down in the aisles, guiding us to our assigned seats for a performance. Now, this is what the benign practices do. When you do not confirm to these benign practices, then the next recourse of action might include violence incident that Anju X explained, such as Hatra. So, and if you want to talk about these incidents like Hatra, in many ways, one has to pay more attention to the benign everyday form. <clears throat> So, my, so what one of my one of my thesis is that my, my thesis as a result is that um, caste is, uh, lives on and also all, has always lived through communicative elements on a daily basis. Whether benign or so-called uh, exceptional aberrations, communicative elements such as code, signs, verbal utterances, materials, uh, you know, physical or abstract, have always been the means of transmitting caste hierarchies and have been the sources of violence that often resides outside the purview of legal regime. <clears throat> now, let's take one step further of this, um, um, what is happening outside the legal uh, regime, uh, you know, the, the so-called law agency, that's one thing that's very important. But denigrating behavior, behavior manifesting as opposed to superiority, assumptions of, about capability and suitability for certain work, all this, you know, if you look at how they are panning out on a daily basis, I, I would say they, they, they form what you call cost hate speech. And I use the word cost hate in a hyphenated form because it deserves a separate distinction. Um, it's not just the hate, like racialized hate speech, it's a cost hate speech. It's very, very particular. I mean, I go, I, you know, to a Tamil audience, I go into details how it's actually very new, explained in a nuanced fashion in Tamil, but I reserve that for now. <clears throat> so, however, hate speech is recognized in international covenants on the elimination of discri discrimination and protection of human rights, but not caste hate speech. And caste hate speech is often actually reduced to be trolls. I'm... I'm using, I'm focusing on caste hate speech because it's one of the most dominant forms of caste-based discrimination in today's contemporary, you know, especially online and so on. Um, however, um, it still out, it's, you know, stays outside the purview of law, international law, it's yet to recognize. And secondly, most importantly, these are mediated by private firms, caste hate speeches are because of technology platforms and so on. So the other point I'd like to draw attention to, legal regimes are not necessarily state-owned actors anymore. So now that independent private sectors have become um, uh, guardians of free speech and so on and so forth, one has to pay attention to unconventional legal regimes now include private corporations as well, because they also tend to regulate our speeches, hate speeches, and so on, hate crime, and so on and so forth. Now, <clears throat> this is this is particularly important because if you look at the way that Western um, uh, tech platforms, for example, the way they maintain hate speeches, or they may be sorry, they they, they qualify what constitutes a hate speech, what doesn't. It what becomes interesting is that their definition or their, their principle is rooted in Western liberal principles of law. And that becomes the universal application. And that Western principles of legal doctrine may or may not be appropriate tool The Shadi.com very rightfully, from, from legal point of view, argued that they did not, I mean, 
they argued whether they, that was the truth or not, I don't know. I'm just taking their word for granted. They argued that we are not actively promoting caste-based algorithm, but if our community chooses to behave that way, we do not interrupt them, right? Now, that position needs to be challenged. I mean, I don't know how far it's true. Assuming that is true. Now, this is the problem with impartiality testing, justice, context, as a concept. The Shadi remains the claims that they remain impartial to our consumers' choices. Whereas if you look at Ambedkar's social justice, it's actually claiming priority on something over the other. You have to take active position. It's not, it's not the uh, distributive justice. You know, you do that to everybody. Now, what happens is that this sort of uh, um, 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 principles are already grounded in everyday conversation, especially in technical platforms. And, and it is also kind of reflected in international covenants when we talk about you know, inclusion of caste hate speech, then they will say, we can't advocate that that's actually might even be construed as we are against something. So this is the challenge we are facing now. Now, that is the reason why, for example, um, when Black Lives Matter uh, becomes um, um, a sign of a political and uh, uh, ethical position for various social media platforms, uh, Dalit Lives Matter can become a very, very um, uh, sensitive slogan. And, and as a result, you know, uh, it, and, 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 and this is also reflected, not only tech platforms, it's also reflected on the reluctance of civil society organizations, especially working on tech, human rights, and communication rights, especially coming from South Asian. I was, um, I'm, I'm currently uh, finalizing a re research report on caste hate speech, and I've been talking to various um, rights-based advocates um, in South Asia, especially those who dabble in you know, technology, um, human rights, and um, anti-discrimination activists, and so on and so forth. And not a single organization, this sort of a tech rights, the anti-discrimination organization, not, not any, one of them um, have thought about caste hate speech. And that cannot be a coincidence. Um, I'm not blaming them. I'm not, uh, 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 but I'm saying this, the consciousness, there's an unconscious bias of that. And that needs, and that needs to be, uh, you know, looked at and engaged with. <clears throat> so, for example, um, when, when I was speaking to a couple of uh, tech platforms who, they, who, sh who shall remain nameless, and they said they depend on um, um, <clears throat> their user communities to measure address is that I've talked about, um, you know, we have to get root forms of uh, a violence and, it, and then its effect on cost, I mean, as cost atrocities, but we also have to pay more attention to these new forms of manifestation. Unless we pay attention to these new forms of man manifestation, it will actually become normalized. And then it will take us one more, it's, it'll add another battle. So, um, um, there is an uh, there is an app um, in in India. Um, there are two apps actually. One is used um, uh, post Hatra actually. Post Hatra, uh, some apps were designed to ensure safety for these women. So women and, and and users, you know, parents and so on and so forth. They were they can highlight safe area. They can mark on the app so they can you know potentially. Um, that, that would increase women's uh, opportunity to, you know, to stay safe. And it was found out that several Dalit colonies was, were marked unsafe, right? Now, this is, this is an interesting, this example is interesting because how uh, offline bias is translated into data bias and how the data bias becomes normalized and makes the internet casteist yet normalize it. And this is completely out. And this is, this is a very, and, and the internet companies have a huge responsibility, but and they are not in a position to do this uh, because they don't know. So, so, the, so the, at the moment, um, 
some of us are paying more attention to this sort of uh, everyday practices that is actually happening outside the purview of um, um, the, the so-called legal regime, which is very important. I'm not discounting that at all. But by working on benign practices and, and what's happening and make, giving adequate recognitions to such as cost aid switches, we will be able to deal with the, the, the other end more effectively. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that really fascinating presentation. Um, I think, you know, uh, this this kind of event really would be an ideal tool as uh, for law teachers, actually, because I think you've mapped out for us the various meanings of the law, which we as legal academics often deal with, you know, which is the formal state law, but also various other non-state law regimes of control, uh, as you've shown through, you know, the use of tech platforms, uh, and also this kind of gradation of, uh, you know, casteism that you've uh, kind of set out for us from the more benign to the more active and violent and brutal forms and to to really pin down what the role of formal state law would be in addressing this range of you know, custody's violence. So that was a really fascinating talk. Um, we have a couple of questions that have uh, built up, and I think both these papers speak very beautifully. But maybe I'll start with some of the easier questions that we've collected. I think two are clarifications for you, uh, Murli. I think one of them has to do with asking whether the cases of um, caste-based uh, discrimination are unique to particular parts of the UK. Um, and the second question is uh, asking you for an illustration uh, about civil society organizations, which I think you uh, alluded to uh, the fact that, you know, uh, a lot of these tech HR and civil society organizations didn't actually have a position on, on you know, the unconscious caste bias that they had. So maybe you can address those two quick sort of clarifications. And then there are some uh, more difficult questions that I'll pose to both you and Anju. We sorry, can't hear sorry. you. Um, yeah. the, um, the first question is, um, yes, it, it tends to happen largely um, um, where South Asian demography, you know, is more. However, there are two type, there are two more types of uh, occurrences that are com coming up recently. Uh, one is uh, pattern, two, pa two types of patterns. One is ca campuses on campus. And this is not so much because there's an active discrimination happening, but so much because there's a pronounced Hindutva culture is actually happening, carnivalizing Hindutva culture. And carnivalizing Hindutva culture, this is again, uh, going back to my this, uh, heart of the point that this is again, you know, how do you punish this? It, it's, you know, it, it's very difficult. So uh, the carnivalizing Hindutva culture and, and, and its presence on campus uh, shuts down um, um, certain type of students who do not subscribe to that ideology, but also targets consciously and unconsciously the Alis and Prescott group members. That's one pattern. Uh, <clears throat> the second pattern is that uh, thanks to globalization, it's not just the second generation British South Asians who actually only suffer from caste discrimination. In fact, many say they don't, that's good. But you also have the influx of first generation British South Asians, someone like me. And when we work in a, let's say, a, 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 a global supply chain or a, a corporate office, and uh, this, what happened in Cisco is like, it's just a telling example of uh, the tension that the dominant cost, <coughs> sorry, dominant cost employees um, have um, with the, uh, the so-called, uh, um, you know, low cost or lowered cost members. So that's another pattern. So this also provides an opportunity for us to actually engage with the UK government saying that this is, there are some telling patterns that are emerging. So some of us are trying to actually capture this pattern. So that's one thing. The second question, can you come, is some illustrations about civil society. Um, illustrations in the sense, I mean, I'm looking at you, Prabha, if you can help me. Yeah, the question specifically is, uh, can you please give us some illustrations about civil society? Do, do you not believe that civil society also has its own conceits in the context of India and South Asia in general? Um, okay, so, I think uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to answer, re reflect on that more instead of answering okay. that. Yeah. I think civil society comes into so many different shades. 
and uh, um, uh, and uh, it's it it would be um, it would be naive to imagine that civil society organizations are um, uh, <clears throat> progressive lots <clears throat> because they carry a similar uh, unconscious bias like anybody else. And it's been very clear that civil society organizations in South Asia is also dominated by um, a certain groups and not always, you know, if you are Dalit, I see, you become a Dalit rights organization. It never considered as a human rights organization, right? Whereas the non-Dalit rights organization always say uh, we are human rights organization, we are tech rights organization, right? So that, that alone is very telling and revealing. And it is in that context, I, 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 there is no surprise, personally speaking, but it is very telling that, you know, these organizations who actually go to um, international spaces, occupy international spaces in, in the rights, anti-discrimination spaces are so muted, are so, you know, completely uh, deluded of their own um, um, uh, uh, manifestation of uh, uh, um, caste-based discrimination or absence of talking about it. So I, I, I don't want to really blame them or something because that's not going to be helpful here for a strategic alliance and solidarity, but that's an area that needs to be woken up and then they need to join us. That's kind of answer. Wonderful, thank you. So then there are three sets of questions that I would like both of you to respond to. Um, so the first question is about, uh, you know, uh, I think goes to your point about the biases of uh, liberal legalism, right? So one of the questions that Sanghash Telang has that, you know, he quotes Dr. Ambedkar to, who then quotes Edmund Burke to say, there's no method for punishing the multitude. Law can punish single solitary recalcitrant criminal. So how do we understand the relationship between uh, multitude and the law in the context of caste atrocities? I think that's a very, uh, uh, that is a terrific question to, uh, contemplate the possibilities and the potential of the law for securing uh, justice in this context. So that's the first question. Uh, the second question also relates to the response of the law. So uh, this question is more specifically on whether it makes sense to legally a supremacist in the Indian context and whether such a classification would actually help move, uh, you know, the, the the Dalit rights movement. And then the third question has is more about solidarity uh, within, you know, uh, amongst uh, Dalit Bahijan groups. So um, the commentator who uh, won't reveal their name uh, has asked, the word dominant caste of late has been used rather liberally. So while the Hathras perpetrators were Rajputs, in many instances, lower OBCs are also tagged as dominant castes. So what are the implications of this kind of broad brushing on a possible Dalit Bahujan solidarity? And related to it, I think, is the question of Dalit consciousness. Is to say that there's a section of Dalits who are generally low, lower Dalits who claim to be victims of casteism by upper Dalit caste groups. Um, and against which the former are said to be joining the BJP. So the question is, how do we address how caste not only differentiates between uh, different castes, but also within uh, the caste, uh, so that you know, Dalits themselves believe that there might be uh, Dalits who are perpetrators and then Dalits who are victims. So those are the three sets of questions to begin with. And either of you can you know, uh, engage with either of these questions. Who'd like to go first? Anju, I would like you to go first because I've already spoke, so please. Um, I would like to uh, respond to the question in relation to uh, Dalit consciousness needs solidarity across caste groups and how can we think about a consciousness when there is kind of uh, different groups and there is pervasive of caste uh, which at times is understood as Dalits is equal to victims, that question. So um, I, my uh, response to that would be that um, I put Dalit as activists who actually belong to different caste groups across, um, uh, across India, in, different, in these three different regions of India that I was looking at. And um, tends to happen quite often in terms of uh, within a particular caste group, there is also the attempt to bridge uh, the gaps between different castes. And sometimes even you would see like 
uh, 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 is coordinating with chamars uh, uh, there, there would be uh, so there, there would so basically there would be like um, malas coordinating with madigas so there would be like there is a there is a way in which there is some formation of a dalit consciousness that takes place despite the internal tensions that might be existing it's not that th this is an easy kind of a, uh, a relationship that these activists have with each other or that uh, the question of uh, dif of uh, different uh, sub caste does not emerge at all but i think that there is a possibility of solidarity and that is pr pretty much like um, very evident in the Dalit women's movement, especially. So yeah, that, that would be my response to that. Uh, Murli, would you like to answer any of the other questions? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I think that uh, every time we talk about um, Dalit solidarity or anti-caste emancipatory politics, <clears throat> people tend to bring this question about, what about infights, right? And what, how do you resolve this? It sounds often more accusatory in terms of clean up your own house than a statement comes in support of genuine solidarity. I'd like, just like to register that first. <clears throat> Having said that, so it does exist. That's very true. So what are we going to do about it? That's, that should be the right question. It, the question should not be, what are you going to do about it? Right? Because Dalit emancipatory politics, from Dalit epistemic point of view, the word Dalit stands for anti-caste expression. If someone practices caste discrimination, which Ambedkar has very clearly talked about in, under gradation of inequality, so there is no need to rediscover this, you know, there's something that says, Oh my God, this is happening again. Oh, this is new thing. No, we just talked about it. In fact, those of you who, which some of you may not have be familiar with the idea that Ambedkar's uh, proposition about um, 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 depressed classes consists of three kinds, not just untouchables. Just so you know, untouchables, unapproachables, and then finally unseeable. And he made this distinction because each distinction is actually superior to the other, leaving the unseeable, the most depressed and oppressed one. We have yet to uncover someone beneath the unseeable. Who knows they already exist, so we don't even know, or unknowable. So the, pro the, the point I'm trying, I'm not trying to be cynical. I'm not trying to dismiss the genuineness of this question, but I'm also uh, trying to actually answer it in a manner that this is a question that we all should collectively ask our consciousness. So any anti-caste behavior, any caste, caste-related discrimination behavior by anybody uh, cannot be claimed as being part of a Dalit emancipatory politics, period. So when viewed from that point of view, if someone talks within that, we are all trying to build solidarity planks. And without solidarity planks, we cannot go anywhere. So uh, it is because of that, with that intent, we built Dalit Solidarity Plan, and we are building Dalit and Bahuj, Dalit Bahujan Adivasi's plan. And there may be aberrations within that plan. One is fully aware of it, but that does not mean the purpose and the po politics behind that uh, um, epistemy is lost. That's my response. Sorry. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Do you, did either of you have a response to the question on, you know, the caste supremacist categorization? Um, okay. Uh, very sorry, Andrew. Just, I, it just follows through from the yeah. point that I made, so I, I can just say it in two sentences. <clears throat> Again, caste supremacist is actually a very helpful term to unpack. Sa caste is the behavior that occurs at all levels. And it may or it may not be punishable with the, with the preview of law, but it clearly is a very useful conceptualization that unpacks the benign, subtle, cultural, so-called cultural practices, disguised, you know, so disguised cultural practices. So in a sense, to me, caste supremacist is uh, it's a kind of a, 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 a sort of a very nuanced, loaded 
cultural term, not cultural term, a term used deployed by cultural studies, so to speak, to understand, to unpack everyday casteism. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that, that um, it, I am assuming caste supremacists would come in relation, in, it's, a, it's, it, it's parallel to racial supremacy. So I think it's, uh, it's an interesting term because it brings in that parallel that I, I think a lot of uh, contemporary scholars as well as Dalit women themselves have been like trying to build a parallel between race and caste. And I think this also kind of builds on that. So it would be an interesting term to work with, yes. Wonderful. Just so that we don't, you know, uh, constantly speak, I think I would now want to invite one of the, pan uh, one of the attendees to pose a question. Uh, to the panelists. So Lalan, Bagel, would you like to ask your question on Dalit political philosophy? Are you there? Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. It's wonderful. I work in a Chandigarh and I find whatever two of my speakers have said is actually the same that uh, is, is the case, you know, uh, so-called university which I work, caste operates in a, such a subtler form, I can't do anymore. But at the same time, uh, I have a dilemma. When you say epistemological, my own friends who are from a particular background, say they are ca by caste, they are oppressed. When it comes to solidarity about Hathras, they do, do not go beyond the campus. So most of the time I fail to understand why only I'm confined to my own campus, own career. Is it not the case that I should build solidarity across the spectrum? So it's, it's an upper caste and others who are activists in the city, they participate in the process, but my own academic community does not participate. So as a scholars, I want your own reflection. Where do I locate the whole question of Dalithood? Should I carry the guilt? Uh, or it's a guilt cannot be distributed like Hitler's, you know, whole Germany's guilt can't be distrib distributed in the whole German. So where do I locate myself in this kind of dilemma when I do not go beyond my own Dalithood or victimhood and expand my solidarities? This is a question which uh, actually Gopal Guru responds in the Crag Mirror and many others, but I want to hear from my two speakers. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. So Murli or wow. Anju? Yeah, I'll try. Um, <clears throat> all I can say that you're not alone. Um, um, this is a very familiar trajectory. And uh, it, this is, uh, this is why I think that uh, one of the things that we don't uh, talk enough about, um, uh, um, um, we don't talk enough about is the, the psychological well-being um, and then and the, cost, the, the cost impact on psychological well-being on Dalits and um, oppressed communities. <clears throat> um, I, I think we're still waiting for our own Franz Fanon. Um, um, I think uh, we, which it's, 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 uh, it's, I completely empathize with you. I do, not, I do not think I have an answer or solution to it, but I don't think uh, what I can tell you very firmly, there's no need to feel guilty. Um, uh, <clears throat> I, mean, I sound like a counselor, no, I'm not, but I'm just saying that, you know, there's no, I don't think uh, one should feel guilty about anything, especially when we are not actually doing, when others are not doing enough, and when others are actually perpetuating their own act willingly or unwillingly, and I see a comment here, uh, you know, say, uh, <clears throat> let's not call anything as a con uh, you know, unconscious bias. Yes, it's not, it's not, you know, it's, it's all willful, whether it's conscious or unconscious, it's, a, it's a, on, on some level, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a willful performance, willful act. Let's just recognize that. And I, I, it's a long battle. I mean, I do not have, I do not have, uh, your, I do not know enough of your context, but all I can say is that, uh, the, 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 okay, okay, this is the problem, uh, uh, the, the challenge is that civility is a, it's a double-edged sword. And especially Dalit civility sometimes can be more a burden than um, a useful tool. Because 
the caste system operates in such a manner that it actually puts the onus of civility on Dalits um, and then expects the oppressed caste perpetrators to understand it. And so, 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 so these are some of the reference pointers only I can share with you. I'm sure that we have, you know, we can talk beyond this platform, but uh, um, just now those are my immediate reactions. Thank you so much for sharing that. Wonderful. Anjil, did you want to respond? Oh, I, I don't think I have a response. There's actually a, a question specifically for you, uh, Anju, which is that are there any legal regulations used by the Indian government authorities to limit attempts by Dalit feminist groups uh, to spread attention to their costs abroad, uh, um, similar to what we see with respect to other groups who are recently protesting uh, and being portrayed as terrorists? Yeah, as far as I know, there are no uh, legal uh, uh, legal kind of mechanisms to do that, like that, like there are no legal steps that are being taken to curb Dalit women activists, um, activism abroad, abroad. But in the past, Dalit groups have faced um, issues when, like for instance, when they wanted to present at the uh, World uh, Conference Against Racism, as most of us would know, uh, the Indian government was not in favor of that, and they didn't want uh, the issue of caste to be brought uh, brought up on uh, in the context of race. So, yeah, like there are those kinds of pressures that the Indian government would would create, but I don't think they've actually done anything legally. Great, thank you so much. Then there are two questions which go to the question of whether law can address caste-based discrimination. So. I think one of them points to uh, a recent a judgment of the Supreme Court, uh, which says that castlers made in the context of property disputes are not an atrocity. So it would have to be, uh, you know, an atrocity is an act only for, uh, you know, on the basis of, you know, caste has to be the driving force for it to be called uh, an atrocity and whether anti-discrimination law can actually help. And related to that is a question by Malini Ranganathan on whether the practice of you know, ascribing pure veg, um, you know, um, holding to a restaurant or to rental accommodations, uh, whether this clearly uh, furthers caste-based discrimination and segregation in urban India and whether this should be uh, punishable by the law. And I think, I guess one related question is around education. I think, um, you know, so uh, two of our participants talk about you know, whether caste-based incidents occur in UK schools and what is the role of the educational system in, you know, addressing this kind of discrimination uh, at the get-go when uh, students are, you know, young? Um, as far as Malini's question is concerned, uh, like, legally, shouldn't it be considered as a form of housing discrimination? Yes, of course it should be. But um, I don't think there have been any moves to uh, legislate that at the moment. Um, there is also um, the, uh, uh, what was the other question? This is around the atrocity. Education that plays a- And uh, education as well. Yeah. Education system plays a very important role in normalizing uh, everyday caste relations. How could this be challenged? I think the classroom space itself is like a really political space. And I think I, it could be challenged by individual teachers within the classroom through their curricula, through their interactions with students, through their grading practices. There are so many different ways of doing that. But uh, I don't know where to begin to answer that question from because like, yeah, I mean, it needs to be challenged, but yeah, like re more re reservations do help bring in different kinds of students, but how to make the classroom more inclusive, that's like a really difficult question to deal with. And I'm sure Professor Prabha Murli would probably be better equipped to answer that. <laughs> Go ahead. Murli, would you like to respond? Yeah. Um... So I'm, I'm going to respond to this as uh, Supreme Court's Kostler and then vegetarian restaurant and education, right? <clears throat> um, I think the Supreme Court uh, judgment is very, very interesting. Inter interesting in a sense. Uh, uh, it kind of actually, again, goes back to my presentation. What the Supreme Court has been doing lately is that they are taking uh, certain aspects of, um, uh, you know, provisions of, they are, they are taking certain provisions and they're kind of actually 
kind of a, taking it outside the purview of that law. And for example, in this case, they are saying a caste slur is not a crime if it is not targeted at someone else. So that's that's like to, to get the nutshell of it. So if it happens in private conversation, so two Ku Klux Klan members can stay in a room and talk all night bad things about black people, and that's not racism. That's what it comes down to, right? Now, what the court is actually trying to do is that private conversations cannot be uh, uh, considered as a crime, right? But then again, the problem here is that they're undermining cost practices um, that, you know, they are kind of actually recognizing there are lots of cost practices that can happen once you actually dismantle the legal effects of it. So again, this can be fought, you know, uh, you know legal professionals um, have to fight against. And this is not something that, um, um, uh, something that um, uh, we can do much about it because this is clearly um, uh, an evidence of um, uh, present day's government but also, it also exposes the uh, deeply casteist judiciary that we've always had, but now has the audacity to come out and of the closet. So this is thing, you know, we shouldn't be surprised, but we should continue to um, um, fight about it. Yeah, <clears throat> against it. The vegetarian restaurant, it's a very interesting question. Um, it's again, we are talking about how caste is being culturalized and therefore escapes the purview of legal provisions. Right. In Tamil Nadu, for example, during the Dravidian uh, self-respect movement, uh, there used to be Brahmanal's cafe. And it was very clearly written. There was no, there were no vegetarian restaurants at the time. All most vegetarian restaurants were called as Brahmanal's cafe. And at, at its peak, only Brahmins were allowed as a, a customers, um, con, you know, consumers clientele, but then they opened up to non-Brahmin clientele, but it was still called as Brahmanal Cafe. And it didn't happen, it happened not long ago, just 1930s and 40s, um, you know, people, were, and even up until 60s, there were references to Brahmanal Cafe. Now that was prohibited by law because there was a direct reference to it. And now what happened after that <clears throat> was a clever manipulation of law instead of calling it Brahmanal's cafe, they started calling it vegetarian restaurant. Obviously, I'm only talking about example from Tamil Nadu, things might be different elsewhere. So this here again, we have to, we cannot do much about it, which goes back to the point that cannot be political reformation without social reformation, as Anne Baker said. So which is, this is why we need to look at the unconventional uh, legal regimes and its, and, its, 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 and its role in perpetuating everyday cost practices. Um, and, and, you know, one way of, this is where we have to have much more um, nuanced and much more frank dialogues on some of these markers, cultural, so-called cultural markers. And the problem is, I find it, um, especially dominant castes, uh, intellectuals and progressives are often very touchy and sensitive. And they say, and they say they will immediately come back to, uh, the, you know, this anti-caste argument, oh my God, now everything has to change, is it? That, I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying it, but they're very sensitive towards this kind of, I mean, you know, such conversations to a degree have started happening in the US about racial politics, but we do not have that space. So my point is that we have to push this space to have this conversation what, what do we mean by vegetarian restaurant? Where does this concept of vegetarian restaurants come to play? Why can't we have a multi-cuisine restaurant as the norm of the day? You know, why should we call multi-cuisine restaurant as a, um, a meat and non-meat restaurant as a military hotel in Tamil Nadu, for example? I don't know about other places. So we have to have this cultural conversations, you know, social conversations about caste. So we, it only goes back to the point that not everything can be achieved uh, by enactment of law, because you know things can be dismantled and can continue to flourish and prosper. Education, um, I'm, I'm having a mixed view about this. You know, yeah, education is an important, and uh, uh, but education alone cannot change anything. Um, I mean, look at our judiciary, for example. So that's that's just a telling example. And I know the you know the Brahmins in the Silicon Valley are another example. It's highly educated. They still are actually casteists. So that's I you know. But it, with regards to another question about caste, casteism in UK school, um, yes, it does. It does get practiced. It does get practiced, and again, in a very subtle manner. <clears throat> 
and most often student parents are not quite um, are willing enough to uh, report it uh, about report about it partly because there is no system or process how to go about it so if you report about it you know how will the schools do not know how to actually deal with that because there is no legal system or provisions as such the equal utilities act is actually intends to get drop the word cost out so these are the problem uh, that the reason why they should keep the cost in the equality act but that's not happening so yeah so it is happening but uh, we the other problem in this country is that many caste associations are disguised as community organizations for example we have a north london brahmin society we have patel society um, so very many organizations are disguised and again this sort of a conversation should come from progressive dominant caste members so there is a role for, for them to play so they have to articulate, they have to call this out. And that's, that's how the conversation can be pushed and then can be brought under the purview of law. At the moment, it's outside. Thank you. Great. I think just, uh, I think we we'll go for a final set of questions and then maybe I'll uh, ask for your final words. So the last set of questions has to do with the Equality uh, Act. So one question that Sonu Engineer has is whether you were implying, Murli, that the threatened removal of caste from the category of race will not be a disaster because it's still acknowledged within religious discrimination and hate speech. Um, I don't think you were saying that, but I think you know maybe it would be worth clarifying. And then another question asking whether uh, why the government wishes to remove caste as a protected group and whether this position can actually uh, be reversed. Um, and then I guess uh, also question to look at the crystal ball and kind of say, you know, will the situation of Dalits actually improve under the current BJP government? And, um, you know, in the future with the Congress government uh, do more for the Dalit community than they have done um, in the past. So uh, Anju and, and Murli. Do you like to respond? Maybe Murli, you can just respond to the, the Equality Act. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think you know, Prabha, you rightly said, I didn't imply that, but um, I think for the sake of clarity, um, I, I think there is a, there is a I, I did mention there are, there are some uh, uh, contentious uh, responses from certain anti-caste campaigners when the UK um, um, conflated caste and race. <clears throat> because there's a clear, um, um, I mean, the Turkey versus Chando case was fought on the ground because let's, let's actually take a step back. The Turkey woman, the victim, she's from uh, Northeast and uh, going by a technicality, she's an Adivasi, right? Uh, uh, but for some reasons, from some legal strategy, for some legal opinion I rendered on the particular case, I, I, which I do not know in detail, um, is that she? The case was fought that um, her identity can be described, um, you know, kind of you know, extended the race ex extended within the definition of ethnic origin as race. So when it was counted as an ethnic origin and discriminated marginalized ethnic origin ethnic person, then it was actually referred to an extension of race, and that is how the whole caste is actually kind of was brought into that ethnic origin, um, you know, definition. But then the act actually made a specific reference to caste it it did accept that reference include that reference and that clearly i, I you know annoyed uh, lots of uh, pro casteist lobbyists in this country who are very powerful as someone said here the political pressure and you would be very amazed to know that uh, the kind of us benign uh, <coughs> hare rama hare krishna and they are their their most um, vile uh, lobby strategy to get it out it's it's um it's it's beyond belief, but that's for another date, for another time. Um, so, so 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 therefore, it is now the government intends to repeal. I think it is very difficult uh, to reverse this one uh, because um, um, we have to admit the the, the opposite stake, uh, oppositional stakeholders are more influential, and powerful, and they have more House of Lords and um, uh, MPs and so on. However. <clears throat> The, the, we, the, the, the bottom line is that it can be, the debate is not dead yet because the government ex acknowledges the existence of caste in the UK, number one. And as of now, the hate crime um, uh, recognizes caste, but uh, I've just heard last week that they're also trying to remove that from hate crime prosecution, uh, but I do not know much about it. Yeah. 
Anju, did you have any response to any of those questions? Not really, no. I, I think I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, and I guess what about the question around the, you know, the, the government in power? Did either of you have any thoughts on that? Sorry. What we might expect <sighs> under the current government and if a future Congress government would do any better? Oh, oh, the, 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 will, will Dalit's life get better? Well, this is, okay, I mean, I, I, there's, there's a very sensational answer, no, uh, um, but, but I think that's, that's very reductive. Uh, I think the, the, the long shot of the, uh, the, uh, the situa situation is that, uh, I think we were talking about this prior to this uh, uh, the, uh, meeting, uh, some of us. Um, um, what is happening right now is not just exclusively attributed, should not be exclusively attributed to BJP. I think what's happening now is a result of what has been happening for a very long time. And uh, the, pre the predecessors actually have enabled today's condition. So to, to, to say that judiciary is now corrupt is absolutely ridiculous um, because it's always been like that, but it's now it's come out of the closet. So yes, it's going to get, it might get, it, it, my, my, my fear is it might get worse, but I think it's, um, um, it's, it's not, it's, it, that's partly because of this existing government and so on, but it's also but partly because of how the Indian middle class has suddenly emboldened themselves, emboldened to be explicitly casteist. And that is why some of these conversations need to happen outside legal purview. We need to have a, a, you know, a safe space like such as this one that we should be able to allow to say and I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to engage with the uh, Hindutva guy, person, to talk, you know, engage. So we need, that will only take that conversation back to, you know, law and other implementing instruments because we're losing the battle. We need to have a creative conversation. That's what I feel. So yes, your to answer is, I'm not answering your question directly, but you get the drift. Thank you. Wonderful. I think that is a great note actually to, to end on the call for safe spaces and creative conversations. Do either of you have any other final comments before I hand you back to Sheila? No, thank you. Great, thank you. Right, well, thank you so much. Um, I think we've come to the end of our time. We are closing the session a bit early today. Um, but before we do that, I just want to take a couple of minutes to say thank yous, first of all, to this excellent audience that has been so engaged and has very thoughtful questions that have shaped the conversation. Uh, thank you to Prabha for chairing with so much care and also for your own inputs and insights. And thank you for your excellent contributions, Anju and Murli. Uh, you've really lifted you know, the panel and made it into what it was. Um, as a final word, I want to say that we are releasing a new episode, which will be the last episode of the podcast for this term. And it's actually going to pick up on some of the issues that we talked about now. It's, it's, it's with um, Liver Hume Fellow at LSE called Niranjana Ramesh, who is a, she's an ethnographer of Chennai. And she's talking on the episode about the ecological crisis and food policing and food as one of the sort of scenes where the ecological crisis and casteism plays out. So in continuation of the, some of the themes that we've been talking now, do catch the episode when it drops next week. Um, final word, huge thank you to Vignesh who, makes everything come together seamlessly. Thank you for supporting us in this. Thank you to the audience again. And we will be back next term with more events. Do keep in touch and take care everybody. Be safe and be healthy and enjoy the end of the year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks a lot.